Hey guys, how are you going today? Recently I was asked to analyse the drag flick shot of a player during fairwood hockey. So let's first discuss performance criteria and what makes a successful drag flick. The main aim of a drag flick is to score a successful goal. So let's discuss what an athlete must do to accomplish this. First and foremost, the drag flick is known for its accuracy. So this means hitting a target regularly. The drag flick also generates great speed or velocity on the ball. This makes it very difficult to be intercepted or saved by the opposition. When performed correctly, the drag flick has a very high chance of scoring goals. Some really advanced flickers can manipulate the spin on the ball, allowing it to curve in the air. The key to power and accuracy of a drag flick is a smooth approach or run-up, good footwork, ball pick-up and release. Generally, a three-step run-up is preferred in the order of left foot, right foot, left foot, remembering to try and have the final left foot plant in line with the hockey ball. In this example, our player is using the hop technique during the run-up of the drag flick. The cross-step or hop follows immediately after the final foot plant and transitions into the final stride of the flick. Once the foot has been planted in the final stride, the angle created by the ankle, knee and hip of the lead leg should be around 90 degrees. The athlete must remember to have the lead foot of the final stride open. This means having the toe pointing towards the target. Having a closed foot position increases the chance of injury to the knee as it is in a locked position and it can also damage the ankles and hips. Closed off foot position greatly restricts hip and upper body rotation. As body weight transfers from right hip to left hip, the right foot should also become slightly open and on the balls of the foot. This allows the flicker to push off the ground and generate more power through the hip rotation. Your hip should rotate 180 degrees during your pick up, drag and release. If you are not doing this, you are not getting full power. The upper body should also rotate a full 180 degrees with the right shoulder of the flicker facing the target at the end of the motion to generate maximum forces. As we pick the ball up, the upright angle of the stick should be 80 to 85 degrees. This keeps the elbow close to the body engaging humeral muscles as well as the shoulder muscles. If the angle is less than this, it tends to only engage the shoulder muscles and results in decreased power at release. The face of the stick should be square to the ball or at 90 degrees. To achieve this, the flicker needs to cock the wrist back during the pickup and keep it in line or behind the right shoulder. The ball should be travelling as straight as possible, not to one side or the other at release. So now I'm going to analyse athlete 1 who is dressed in black and his flicking technique. I'll be making some comparisons with athlete 2 who is an experienced flicker and is dressed in white. Traditional drag flicks have a two or three step approach. In this footage of athlete one, the approaching technique is missing a right foot and left foot plant before the hop. He takes only one step before entering the hop. This may be due to lack of training in the skill or understanding of the skill. To fix this problem, the approach needs to be started from further away from the ball. This will give him more room to accommodate the three-step approach. Depending on the desires of the coach or athlete, a two-step approach can be used. Here we have Athlete 2 with a similar technique to make some comparisons in footwork. As Athlete 2 has a two-step approach, his first stride is with the right foot. This allows his final left stride to be in line or close to in line with the ball as he begins the hop. Athlete 1 starts his approach with his left foot. This also turns into his final stride before the hop. This limits the speed he can build up and the force that can be placed on the ball. Practicing stride length for each step of the approach will also assist in good footwork. Remember that the left foot of the final stride of the approach must be in line or in front of the hockey ball. Because of the lack of steps and the timing of them, during athlete one's technique, his hop is too early. This positions the ball in the middle of his body relative to the final foot plant. Compared to athlete two, whose steps are timed well and he has figured out his relative stride length, this allows him to make initial contact with the ball behind his body. 
This again can be corrected by working out the number of steps in the initial run up and the stride length of those steps. Initial contact with the ball or the collection should be made after or very late in the hop of the flick. This ensures that the maximum time and distance is achieved while dragging the ball. To achieve this, the wrists need to be cocked back and a 90 degree angle needs to be created between the stick face and a hockey ball. Again, I'm reinforcing that the stick face should be at 90 degrees on contact with the ball. This angle should be kept at a constant through the majority of the flicking motion and dragging motion. Athlete 1 initially has the stick face at 90 degrees or close to 90 degrees in relation to the ball, but the angle changes during the hop stage of the flick as the approaching footwork is mistimed. Weak wrists will allow the stick face to change angle during the approach and dragging phase of the drag flick. We can combat this in a few different ways. We can strengthen the wrists with free weight training. We can use a weighted ball to encourage the wrists to stay in the cock position. Another way to encourage good stick position is to break down the flick into simpler components. An example of this is standing in front of the ball with the stick already placed in the 90 degree position and just dragging the ball forward through the dragging motion. In this example of Athlete 2, we can see the correct wrist position is highlighted through the motion. This wrist position enables him to create the 90 degree angle with the stick face and the ball and keep this angle at a constant during the majority of the drag. Athlete 1's drag is also quite short. It's only about 1.5 metres long. As the wrists open up midway through the carry, the ball is released early. This results in decreased average velocity that can be produced on the ball. So again, with good footwork, focusing on wrist position and stick position, the carry distance should be lengthened. Athlete 2 is a good example of having the wrist and stick in the 90 degree position for the duration of his flick. His carry is almost 2.5 metres long, allowing maximum time on the ball and maximum force to be transferred. The upright angle of the stick should be around 80 to 85 degrees on contact with the ball. This engages both humeral and shoulder muscles by keeping the elbow close to the body. This also ensures that the levers of the arm are working simultaneously to reduce maximum force and power. If the angle is less than this, it tends to only engage the shoulder muscles, which results in decreased power at release. To correct this shallow angle, the approaching stance should be taller. This will help ensure that the humeral muscles become engaged. As we can see with Athlete 2, having the front foot open will allow him to pivot and rotate the entire momentum of his body to a good finishing point. This is done by pushing off the ground with his right foot, driving more force through his hips, which assists in rotating in time with his upper body. Remember, hip rotation should be around 180 degrees during the pickup, drag and release. If you're not getting this, you're not generating full power. The upper body should also rotate 180 degrees with the right shoulder of the flicker facing the target at the end of the motion to generate maximum force. Athlete 1's shoulder or upper body rotation is only around 90 degrees difference from the starting and finishing. To help maximise the force output, all levers of the body should be synchronised. This means focusing on pushing the right shoulder around at the end of the flick to face the target, opening the angle of the right foot and driving the right leg around so that the hips rotate in time with the upper body. This means the upper body is not restricted by lack of lower body rotation. As you can see in this image, athlete 2's knee and hip are quite flexed. This lowers his moment of inertia and makes it quite easy for his hip to be rotated 180 degrees. Athlete 1's knee and hip position compared to Athlete 2's knee and hip position are quite extended. This raises his moment of inertia, resulting in more work that needs to be done to rotate his hips 180 degrees.